great. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to the Cannabis Society. Uh, we've developed a close partnership with the Cannabis Society. And also, I think, uh, in some ways, a friendship. I certainly consider Bill Hennessy, uh, the founder and CEO of the Cannabis Society, a friend. Uh, and also, I'd like to applaud the work that the Cannabis Society does in making the cannabis world smaller. Uh, Zuber Lawler, for those of you who don't know, is a law firm uh, based in the United States with offices in Los Angeles, where I'm based in Silicon Valley, Northern California, that is, Chicago and New York City. We represent under God a long list of fortune companies and global funds and government entities. Uh, what makes Zuber Lawler unique is that we've also been in the cannabis space for over 13 years doing M&A work, finance, IP, uh, regulatory work and high stakes litigation work. Uh, and when it came up, international work. Our local attorneys work in languages covering 90% of the world's population. Uh, and at this point, in addition to representing a long list of fortune clients, we represent uh, many of the biggest brands in the world. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, it seems to us, gives us a unique perspective, perspective uh, in terms of growing the value of cannabis companies across sovereign borders and facilitating cannabis commerce across languages and cultures throughout the world. This is an exciting topic for me, the notion of uh, uh, bringing the plant and components of the plant into the European market. Today, the U.S. market is, of course, the largest market in the world by far. In fact, uh, the United States is, uh, comprises most of the, uh, of the purchase value uh, associated with the cannabis industry globally. Uh, that's going to change. Uh, there are over 500 million people in Europe with a similar standard of living. So uh, while the largest market of today is the United States, the largest market of tomorrow is certainly the European Union. Uh, so uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to start with a, a thematic point, which is that this plant uh, is extraordinary. I do believe that this is a gift from God. And one of the amazing things about this plant is the way that it brings people together. I've never seen anything else that uh, causes people of diverse backgrounds to come together uh, and, and in the way that this plant does. So to be more precise, uh, uh, you can, in the context of smoking a joint, to put it uh, bluntly and simply, uh, find yourself uh, smoking a joint with, uh, with a doctor, with a farmer, uh, with a, uh, a, uh, uh, an import export person, uh, and somebody who's a factory worker and somebody who's just come out of prison. And uh, while you're doing so, uh, the differences between you, they dissipate and all of a sudden you're celebrating what you have in common. And in that moment, uh, you might have in common simply wanting to get to know your fellow human being better over that experience. Uh, that's quite extraordinary if you think about it. And in that sense, in that thematic sense, I think that that's what's happening here on a global scale uh, in terms of global commerce relating to the plant. Uh, we have the opportunity to allow the plant to make this world smaller. Uh, the uh, uh, one of the uh, challenges of cannabis is the disparate degree to which it's legalized around the world. But that challenge is also the opportunity because it's on folks like us. It's, it's an opportunity for the people on this conference, in this conference, uh, to, for instance, move the plant and components of the plant from there to here. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, can lead to profits and to uh, of course, uh, in and of itself can lead to a business model. Uh, and on that note, uh, perhaps one of the things that we can do here is to allow the Cannabis Society and, and the plant itself uh, to bring all of us together so that we can work together and get to know each other, uh, pursuant to helping each other help ourselves. Uh, so uh, as an example, uh, there may be people on this, uh, and I imagine there are uh, on this conference uh, who are from Latin America. And uh, there are people here who uh, are familiar with the processes of, of importing uh, into Europe. And, and my law firm happens to be familiar with both ends of that. Uh, so uh, in that context, it, it makes sense for us to get to know each other very well uh, so that tomorrow or next week or, or three months from now uh, or a year from now, uh, we can collaborate uh, in order to help our clients or help ourselves uh, take advantage of, uh, one, the reduced cost of, of growing the plant in certain areas of the world like Latin America, and two, the uh, uh, ever-increasing demand uh, associated with the plant uh, in places like Europe. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time with this, uh, with this keynote, uh, because I think many of you already know Zuber Lawler and know me, Tom Zuber. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to say that I find these virtual conferences to be really uh, potentially a groundbreaker. So I'm very excited to participate. I think that everything that makes the world smaller 
uh, is uh, uh, in the context of this plant is a good thing. Uh, and I think that uh, we should all applaud the work that the Cannabis Society is doing. Uh, and I'm certainly grateful to be a part of this conversation. I've met some of you uh, in person or otherwise, and I look forward to meeting those of you I haven't met at some point, either virtually today or some point in the future. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this global conversation relating to the cannabis plant. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Jonathan. If you can put your um, camera on too, that'd be great. Um, so we do have a medical panel and I'll get, um, hi, jo Jonathan. I will hi. have Andrew Rosen kind of speak to what we're gonna be talking about. But before we do that, I'd like to um, have each of you introduce yourselves, tell us about who you are and what you do so the audience um, can get a little bit of an idea of that. So Finn, if you'd like to, to begin first. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> hi, my name is Finn. Finn Hensel. Um, I'm one of the founders of the Sanity Group. So the Sanity Group is a European um, um, cannabis holding that's basically um, trying to unlock the potential of cannabinoids um, for people's health and well-being. So be below the Can uh, Sanity Group, we have several different companies. So one of the company is Vi, V-A-A-Y. Um, and on Vi.com, we are basically building a very strong CBD brand um, that's basically more in the health and wellness sector. Um, and then the second company that we are currently um, already running actively is Senecio, um, Senecio Pharma. And Senecio is a um, medical distributor for cannabis um, that basically um, can come from all over the world. Um, currently, we are importing mainly from the Netherlands. Um, however, we are also talking with a lot of other suppliers to launch them next year into the German market. Um, and we want to focus basically on Germany first. As you all know, that's the biggest uh, market in Europe as we speak. Um, medical cannabis, but we also um, already plan to roll out into other countries where medical cannabis is already or might become a topic. And yeah, we are, we are based in Berlin, 40 people. Um, yeah, and that's basically the main messages about Sanity Group. Thank you so much. Jonathan, when, you, when, you have, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Jonathan, the Group Managing Director of a company called Life. Uh, we're based in London in the UK and uh, our focus is on medical cannabis for patients, patient access. Uh, we've built a number of different business entities in the last 18 months, uh, solely focused on an end-to-end -end closed loop system to help both advance the size of the market and also to establish ourselves as leaders in the UK. Uh, as part of our entity, we have a uh, education platform which is uh, both digital so there's 45 hours of online learning for healthcare professionals to take uh, it's translated into eight languages but the core focus for us is the UK where we've had um, close to two and a half thousand healthcare professionals use our system to date uh, we have a, a training classroom setting where we uh, educate uh, specialist doctors in the UK on a monthly basis in classrooms up to 20 and we have a, a, a chain of private clinics. So we have doctors working in clinics across the UK, describing cannabis to patients. Uh, we also have a pharmacy. Uh, so we, uh, we have a bricks and mortar online pharmacy uh, based in the north of the UK, which has been operational for the NHS for a number of years. And lastly, we have a import distribution company that's focused on bringing products from different parts of the world to the UK market. Thank you so much, Finn. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Now I'll throw it to Andrew uh, to begin the panel. Um, he'll be just quickly introing what we're going to be speaking about and then go directly into questions. Thanks so much. I'd like to thank Tom for the introduction that we heard from Zuba Lawler. Uh, the intellectual property advice they provide is, is what keeps the industry, you know, uh, stable and moving forward in the right direction for businesses to trademark. And then with, with, with Finn and and Jonathan, thank you guys. I actually couldn't be more excited to have the two of you on this platform because of the staunch difference between the UK and the German markets. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. For any of those who are sort of unfamiliar with what we'll discuss today, the European market is, um, I guess it's a flip coin, right? Whether it's unfortunate or fortunate in terms of how staunchly different and unstandardized and fragmented the European market is. But what it provides for is that if you're doing business, looking to do business in the European market, 
paying attention to the regulations and the opportunities that exist with distributors or clinical trials or you know medical patient and or doctor acquisition uh, from the Polish to the Czech, the German to the UK markets is not one and the same. And the two gentlemen here really truly have an insight so deeply in their, their given markets as well as a broader sense uh, of, of this, this reality that exists in Europe. The questions that we're gonna to talk today are relating to you know, active pharmaceutical ingredients and their position as, uh, as, as either a commodity or necessity relating to novel foods. Uh, we're going to discuss um, standardization across the European Union and sort of what that process could look like. Uh, clinical trials, as well as processes to educate patients to um, knowing the types of products they should be prescribed by, by doctors. Um, I guess to, to open us up, this is, you know, in each question, uh, gentlemen, um, it'll be very obvious in terms of whether or not uh, this is sort of a German market or global, you know, sort of across the Polish and German markets mm -hmm. and, and sort of start actually before we get into the questions as what are the what are the current processes uh, and products that are available in the given markets say you know raw material in the German market and potentially clinically validated products in the UK could you just each, each provide your own perspectives relating to the, the fragmented market across Europe Jonathan do you want to start sure so so you you, you want to have an understanding of uh, what products are currently in the UK market the UK and sort of what your understanding is in, in, in each given market, because yeah. <laughs> you know it's, it's uh, okay. Sometimes so, it's up to discrepancy. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so you're you're right. It's completely fragmented across Europe. Um, just just to correct a, a, a population number from from your sponsor, it's actually 740 million across Europe, uh, which which makes uh, the European market double the size of the US potentially in terms of uh, the opportunity to to, to target patients. Um, so the regulation is completely fragmented. There's, um, every market is feeding out their own path to, uh, what compliance and, uh, a good regulatory framework looks like. Uh, and we are hopefully looking to borrow the best parts from, uh, each of those European markets as they, as they mature and as the result of what they're doing becomes more evident. So, you know, clearly there's, a lot of European markets that are uh, in the process of reviewing whether they should open. And there's a whole bunch of others that um, either have been open uh, uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, or perhaps, you know, uh, in, in the case of Germany, uh, slightly longer than that. So um, there's, there's a lot to be said for, for markets like Denmark and Poland. Uh, obviously, Germany is at the very top of Europe. Um, Czech Republic, there, there's movement there as well. Um, uh, when, it, when it comes to the UK, we rescheduled uh, November the 1st, 2018. Uh, the rescheduling for us was essentially a government initiative, um, probably with uh, way too little consultation with the health sector. And as a consequence of that, uh, even though we've rescheduled since November the 1st, 2018, our market really has only started in the last eight weeks. Um, so our patient numbers are completely dwarfed by Germany. Uh, we, we last count, there's probably 250 in the UK, um, but the, the opportunity and potential for 2020, now that we've actually started to see movement is, is very interesting for us. Cool, good. So my perspective on that is, uh, I mean, obviously we started our operations in Germany. Um, Germany is probably not growing as fast as everyone expected it last year, uh, this year. I think the amount of prescriptions will approximately double, which is still a very strong uh, market, uh, market growth. Um, what you really see is that it's a mix of products uh, in Germany that are, that are getting more and more popular. So um, the flower itself is definitely, I would say, the, the largest, group by itself of cannabis-based medications. So a lot of actually doctors um, and more and more actually are su subscribing to flower because um, they rather believe that they want to have the full spectrum of the plant and they don't want to have an isolated API. However, what you can see more and more is that basically also CBD becomes more popular in prescribing and that very often can be a high CBD flower 
but very often the pharmacists also have mixed kits where they basically can mix their own concentration of CBD for certain things. You see now with Epidiolex, uh, there is a CBD medication um, on the market that's against epilepsy. Um, however, you also have the, 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 the classic ones um, like uh, Sativex, which is also a THC CBD um, finished medication or finished drug. Um, and then you have basically the extracts, which are kind of in between because um, they are basically um, not the flower, but also not the finished drug. So, um, and they also get more and more popular. So you really see that um, that group of, of products is growing also very fastly in Germany. Um, I think they're still very small based on the original, uh, based on, based on the, the total basis. But that's basically the product portfolio with which we are working today. Um, Sanity Group mainly, mainly is focusing on the flower, the extracts, and later on also the finished drugs. So we actually want to play in all those markets. How it looks in the different countries, it's interesting. I think uh, Germany is a very strong market where it started with a flower and now is more and more going also in other directions. However, there is still the necessity for the flower, especially also for basic research. And when you look at France, I think, for example, they will go a very similar way to Germany. And uh, the other markets um, outside, um, like as you already mentioned, the UK, Czech Republic, I mean, all those markets are at the end very different from each other because also there's no unified European Union um, legislation on cannabis, as we all know. However, I expect basically that all of those countries will probably start with the flower process and then actually uh, will probably slowly move into other areas as well um, as the market evolves. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It actually is a perfect transition to our first question, which is whether or not herbal drug products such as raw cannabis flower and general full spectrum extracts are long term, are long term treading products in Europe, or are doctors really more interested in prescribing, you know, dosable delivery systems or formulated end products? Sort of, you know, what's the long term potential and trend of these products uh, yeah. in the European market? Yeah, I mean, may maybe I can start here um, because actually, like, this is actually at the at the core of what we look at every single day. Um, you see, basically, if you if you ask doctors in Germany, why don't they prescribe cannabis yet? It's very often um, that they basically believe that, that smoking or vaping the flower is not the right thing to do for the patients. This is several reasons, most of them you already mentioned. Um, the dosation is a problem. So um, even with a vaporizer, the dosability of, of the raw flower is never perfect because one flower has more THC than the other flower. Um, so you will never have a 100% homogeneous, uh, never have a 100% homogeneous um, 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 medication. So I think that's one point. Also the misuse um, of the flower is definitely a, a second point of why many German doctors especially don't want to prescribe the flower. So and the beer farm which is the German um, uh, legal or government authority that is regulating also the, the, the cannabis agency and the, and the narcotics um, 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 authorities this kind of like um, institution also says that they actually in the long run see that we need to get away from the flower and they look more into finished drugs. However, that's actually something that's very interesting question because finished drugs are expensive to develop. Um, the patent um, on those is difficult. It's more on the dosage form and not really on cannabis as a flower. So I, I'm really curious of how Germany will, will actually develop over the next years because what we currently see in Portugal, for example, I think is very interesting. Um, they basically, in Germany, as I already mentioned, the flower is a raw medication and so are the extracts. And um, for example, Sativex and Epidiolex, they're basically finished drugs. And in between those two, two, um, two types, there's a long way in between, right? So to come actually from the flower to ready medication, it's at least five to seven years of clinical trial to actually market something in the European Union. So what we see in Portugal is that basically the government created a third kind of class of medication where you basically can take research that is done in other countries based on historic um, 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 prescriptions. Basically with those kind of research, you can write a dossier and then in, in Portugal, you can basically create a medication or a, or a, or a, or a, or a pharmaceutical that, don't have to, that doesn't have to go through three, three, um, three, three phases of clinical trials. And I think that could be something that would be super interesting for Germany and will also make it much easier for companies like us to market really products outside the flower. However, how this is going to be, it's, it's a very political question in Germany. So it's, it's, it has a lot of dependencies. 
So to, to say that would be more like looking into a glass bowl, but I definitely see that there's movement away from the flower. So that's probably the summary. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we're talking about doctors that are, that are trying to make patients better. So uh, the, the, the idea of uh, prescribing a flower that you, uh, that, that, that you vape is um, extremely alien to, to, to doctors in the UK market. And, <laughs> I think it's interesting, you know, in Germany, where um, clearly because of the number of prescriptions, it's it's uh, a much easier market to to to, to judge how um, how trends are changing, and you know the, the the figures that were released for Q3 this year show that Dronabinol is uh, is on the up um, as well as the finished pharmaceutical products. And I think that's right, you know, the 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 cannabis industry will have you believe that you know they're complete purists and. If you take it away from a from an entourage effect, full spectrum uh, ex extract, or or use of flour, then it just isn't right. But um, you know, we 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 have to edge towards uh, being more pharmaceutical focused um, if we if we want uh, physicians on math to really believe in in the, the standardized safe uh, use of these medications for their patients. Um, and uh, pharmaceutical companies do it in a particular way. Uh, uh, so I think what, what we're going to see is uh, probably a, a fork in the type of approach that the, that the companies that uh, make products uh, operate uh, across the Europe. And one of those forks will be um, the extraction of cannabinoids are uh, stacked in certain ways. So it becomes a personalized medicine uh, where the the processes put in place for the construction of those compounds is, is such that um, it, it is safe, standardized, and uh, therefore a secure medicine to prescribe. And then on the other side, we're, we're, we're going to see an influx of the type of products that um, have been mentioned already, so the Satavex or the Epidiolex of this world. And we'll see uh, a, a few more of those synthetics uh, come through. Uh, hopefully uh, with uh, a, a better long-term effect than some of the ones that are currently on the market. Um, and I think as part of that also, you'll we'll see a change in application. So, you, you know, we're already seeing marketing authorization in the UK for hardware devices that use canisters for, uh, actually at the moment, synthetics, um, where the dose is completely monitored and measured um, and consistent. And the bioavailability of the product that they're, that they're using is just better than pretty much everything else on the market. And we're going to see more of those. So, we're, so we're, we're, we'll see better versions of application. We'll see a more pharmaceutical-led approach, and we'll see a stacking of cannabinoids. So that actually leads into the next question. Finn, Finn what you discussed, which is, um, are clinical trials that are produced in you know, the Israeli, the Canadian, or the Australian markets enough for European doctors to be educated on is, is, is what they're doing in terms of the process to register these products. You know, and, and Jonathan, as you touched on, UK doctors really want to see clinical evidence um, firsthand, right? They want to see, they want to see products that are, that are going through that process. So what, what can be said for these other markets who are going through the process of, you know, diligently formulating, validating end products? And what does that mean for the European market in terms of international trade? So I think, to be honest, um, when we talk again, like what well, I just finished before, um, you know, like um, it's a clear law in Europe to actually have a certified or registered or finished drug. You need to go through three clinical trials. The third one has to give the evidence um, and then you can market the product as a finished drug in the, in the European market. And I think it, it doesn't matter where the clinical trial was done, if it was done in Canada, in Israel, or in Australia. I'm actually quite sure that Epidiolex was not done in Europe, um, at least not entirely. So I think as long as uh, those countries are following the rules that are set by the European Union or the, or the respective countries, I think, uh, of course, the European doctors and the authorities will accept it. The question is only what happens with those trials that didn't go through all three phases. Like, for example, if um, some countries like Israel is doing it, only does phase one or in certain degrees um, phase two and takes evidence out of that. That's actually a thing that will definitely not be enough to market a product in Europe. However, it could be enough for German doctors to basically see that the medication somehow works and then they can prescribe the flower to their patients or the extracts. And I think 
Um, that is something when I mentioned, like, for example, in Portugal, um, from what we hear, they go in new way where they say, look, you don't need to go through all three phases in the clinical trials to basically market a product. You can basically already do it based on research that has been done in other countries. Um, and then you can write a dossier and then basically you get, um, you get to market your product as it will be in Portugal. I think that will be a very interesting way because at the moment you have uh, the problem that in other countries, especially in Israel, the rules of marketing a finished product are much lower than they are in Europe. And that's the reason why we just cannot import the Israeli or same basic, by the way, in Australia, that we cannot just import the Australian or Israeli product and say like, hey, we want to market them here now because they haven't, uh, haven't gone through that three phases. However, I believe that this third way that Portugal is doing is very interesting for basically doing that in the future. However, if it's about prescribing dronabinol or uh, the flower itself or the extracts, I think definitely clinical trials that are successful in other countries help to educate doctors also in Germany or in Europe all over, uh, all over Europe to basically see that the plant can do something good for the patients. Because to be very honest, if you talk to most of the doctors, one problem is still that they perceive cannabis historically as a drug. And that's the reason why this is like, why would I prescribe that to my patients? And if you can educate them with positive trials that has been done in Israel, Canada, or Australia, even though they are not recognized by the German authorities, alone the results of those trials can help basically to improve the trust that doctors have into the, into the plant. Yeah, so, so, um, so, so firstly, yeah, I, I, we, we educate doctors um, all the time and we, we have, a, we have a, on the Academy of Medical Cannabis website, uh, taomc.org um, we have a, a, a platform where anyone can come in and you can search through 600 plus I believe the number is um, bits of evidence from around the world from the last 40 or 50 years and you can select by condition and you can, you can select by the type of evidence that it is um, the large majority is human uh, rather than animal um, so I, I, th I think that's a really good place to start, especially if you have an interest in prescribing cannabis. But um, the, the reality is in the, in the UK in particular that we, we, we have a gold standard. Uh, it's random control trials. It's double blind placebo tests. Um, and if you want marketing authorization for a medicine in this country, uh, you have to go through that process. Um, so uh, that isn't gonna change anytime soon. What is interesting is that the Department of Health um, have been very clear in the last few months where they've said, actually, what, whereas we haven't looked uh, across the pond or in different markets where there's more mature R&D um, space in the cannabinoid world, uh, we should now look at that. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna change much. It just means that we uh, will start to recognize that some evidence does exist that perhaps doesn't meet our gold standards. Um, but we also need to remember that the way that the uh, medicine is currently scheduled and uh, the ability for, for, for doctors to prescribe it is all based on it being a special, uh, a special medicine. So uh, doctors are, uh, are currently prescribing this medicine for patients without those RCT double blind placebo tests. And there are gonna be more of those doctors coming through as well. So the market still survives and grows without these RCTs. The ICT clearly helps the, uh, the, the mass market approach and the NHS to, to actually take note. In terms of the, okay, so in terms of the formulated end products then, um, would there be more of an interest if these products were replicated in the European market? Is there an interest by universities to um, get involved in either replicating research or performing new research and sort of what is the what are the opportunities to stand there to um, you know build build more of an argument towards formulated end products in the markets by doing research in yeah. Germany in the yeah. UK so what we see by the way um, so we see of course I mean you you might have heard of them as well like Professor Dr. Müller Fall who's at the Medical University of Hanover I mean, all those people are super interested in the, in the area. And um, the problem only is that the government at the moment, or the government authorities as they are now, they don't want to spend public money on the research of, of cannabis. Um, there could be political reasons that could be that they don't see the necessity yet, that could be that they see other priorities right now. However, the problem is that um, if this research 
has to be done, which I believe it has to be because uh, Europe has to also at some point do their own research. This has to be company financed. Um, and I see companies, including us, that actually want to help university financing that, um, that, uh, that uh, research. However, one of the problems is, of course, the research is very expensive, um, especially when we talk about phase three clinical trials. Um, phase one and two are kind of like handable, but I mean, phase three can easily cost up to 50, 60 million. Um, that is, first of all, something that the government wouldn't do anyways, um, but secondly, also something that you would only do if you're relatively sure that something will come out of uh, that process that you can market afterwards, which <clears throat> will only happen if you basically um, have a strong evidence or something. So I see there as actually a kind of problem right now because normally it's the big pharmaceutical companies who do that research. They are not entirely or they're not, they're not really interested in cannabis. Um, first of all, because they cannot patent it, and secondly, it's 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 very often not in their not not in their focus and not in their business model. So they are basically the only company or the only parties that are left could be actually the foundations, it could be the government or it could be the cannabis companies, due to the reason I just mentioned, um, which is at the end the money and the the focus of of government priorities. At least in Germany, and Jonathan, I'm very curious to hear what what what's happening in the UK, but at least in Germany it's quite still low the amount of research that has been done and is, to, is being done in that area. And that's unfortunate. Uh, however, I think that needs to change. And what we, for example, as a company do all the time, we talk to government politicians, we talk to political um, stakeholders. And what we try to do is to convince them that cannabis should be a priority and that, that there also should be um, public money going into, into, um, into research of that plant. Yeah, uh, so so uh, I, I think from my, from my perspective, it, it, it's it's a phased approach. So I I, I mean cl clearly yes, more RCTs, uh, phase one, two, threes, um, but they take what five to seven years, maybe ten years. Uh, they do require the pharmaceutical company or the the, the company behind um, the, the 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 experiment to uh, put put the money on the table to actually do it themselves. Um, yes, with universities involvement, what we're seeing is uh, uh, the, the first phase really of, of having universities in, involved and they, they are being commercially funded by, by the corporate world. Um, uh, the, the types of evidence that these universities, so some of the best universities, you know, Imperial, UCL, King's College, um, they're, they're, they're doing research on cannabinoids, all of them. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the type of um, research that will get a particular product uh, approved for a particular condition. Uh, it's not that advanced yet, but it's the first phase. You know, we're, we're working towards this, but I agree with Finn, you know, we, 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 need, we need the support of the, um, the LPs mainly to, uh, to actually front some of these larger RCT experiments or we need the influx of new pharmaceutical led uh, cannabinoid businesses to do just the same uh, the, the, i mentioned it's a phased approach so clearly that 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 takes some time what the uk are doing is um, we, we recently promoted um, as the uk uh, a drug science offering called 2021 which is a, a a large observational study it's actually more of a retrospective audit um, but what it looks to do is over the course of two and a half years, 20,000 patients will come through that trial, uh, which will have the influence of opening up the UK market quite dramatically next year. Uh, and the sole premise of it is that we will have uh, physicians writing prescriptions for their patients and then that anonymous data on the <coughs> efficacy of that particular uh, product for that particular patient over time will be recorded into a in, into this registry where we can start to see okay for, for for this particular condition over this duration of time with this type of ratio of thc cbd the other cannabinoids terpenoids whatever um the the outcome is positive or the outcome is negative and uh we hope that that will stimulate the market we, all, we also hope what it would do is we'll have a knock-on effect to bring the price point down on the medicine um, because clearly it's uh, too expensive still um, and it needs to get to a certain point before the NHS really take note. Uh, but it, 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 that for me is the, is the first phase of R&D, uh, which includes mm -hmm. two universities and then phase two. Will be more than the yeah, Jonathan, you're on mute. 
you mentioned, Jonathan, that, you know, it's sort of the responsibility of licensed producers um, and or companies who are, you know, truly pharmaceutically devoted and focused to focus on these RCTs and build the process and, and, and uh, um, cap, you know, provide the capital necessary for phase one, two, threes. Um, is that, there's a staunch difference between the Canadian and the American markets, which obviously have recreational legalization. Um, and let's say, you know, other markets, Germany, which may be considered a, a wellness focused market, medical wellness in the UK, which is really pushing towards that, that phase two, one, two, one, two, three is meaning in, in the general pharmaceutical world, companies raise significant capital to devote the resources necessary to create a product that then can be registered. Um, do you see more of companies doing that in the cannabis industry, treating themselves as pharmaceutical companies and not trying to commoditize on the crop? Or is really the medical space in Europe a long-term raw flour extract space, in which case uh, devoting resources to a formula end product is just uh, uh, tenuous, to say the least? Uh, so, so yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, I, I don't think that the uh, the conservative European medical uh, fraternity will ever allow this industry to uh, have flour and um, extracts uh, leading leading it in the future. You know, we. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, we're, 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 we're talking about medical cannabis. It's, it's just another medicine. It's pharmaceutical. Um, so, you know, I think going back to my last, my, my last comment, a few questions back, I, I, I see it being just it, it, that there's two, there'll be two different types of medicine. There, there'll be the medicine where uh, it would take a kind of magistral uh, type uh, approach, like you see in Germany, where uh, chemists complete the finished product and it will be stacked, probably isolated cannabinoids, um, <clears throat> to standardize medicine, personalized medicine for a patient, which is, which is a very different type of pharmaceutical industry to the one we've currently got today. So that's a, that's a huge shift away from where we currently are with, in pharmaceutical terms. And then there'll be the pharmaceutical side of, of the business, which is just the same as the pharmaceutical industry today. A, single APIs, um, uh, marketing authorization, they've gone through the right RCTs. Yeah, I actually have the same point like Jonathan. Um, I strongly believe, as he said, that the medical part will go away, definitely from the flower in the long run. Um, how it will go away, I mean, we discussed it earlier, it could be one way or the other. Um, the interesting thing is we in Germany still don't see that many traditional pharmaceutical companies being interested in that sector. Um, I mean, Bionorica being one of them uh, sold the business this year to Canopy Growth. So it's basically, you see, even you can argue that some companies are even exiting it. However, I strongly believe um, what, what Jonathan said, that the medical part will strongly go into API and like into, into finished pharmaceuticals or finished drugs. However, what's also an interesting question is uh, what will happen on the non-medical side? I mean, CBD becomes more and more a wellness-oriented uh, ingredient in, in food and beverages in Europe. It's in a gray zone because officially it's novel food, but uh, not every country is sticking to that kind of catalog. Um, and then also the question, I mean, Luxembourg will legalize next year. Um, there are also other countries that think about full legalization. I actually think there could be a majority in Germany for full legalization after the next election when there will be a conservative plus green um, government. So I think there's a lot of moving things in the whole discussion of where this will go. But coming back to the medical panel that we sit in today, um, I believe that it will strongly go into, into API and, and away from the flower. Okay, so uh, actually, you know, we got time for basically two more questions. Um, and the last one, I'll <laughs> it's a bit of a contrarian question, so I hope you guys, uh, you know, uh, answer honestly in the sense that you know, we'll talk about legalization and what that means for medical. The first question, though, with regards to APIs, um, because there are people in the next panel that, that, that manufacture and distribute active pharmaceutical ingredients. Are we looking at APIs being integrated into extracts sold um, directly to patients in sort of that raw extract form and that sort of the, the bypass and all foods are really, are APIs going to be the building box to a pharmaceutical industry, you know, in which case, you know, what, where, where are APIs now? And I guess we've also been asked a question from, a, from one of the participants in terms of THC distillate. Right now, the majority of the APIs available in the market in Europe are uh, a CBD or CBG monocannabinoids. We yet to see THC isolate and distillate provided in the market. Um, 
at what point will, will, will you see more of an import and or manufacturing of THC isolate distillate um, for the purposes of pharmaceutical drugs in the European market? Uh, okay, so um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, w w we are. Uh, so there's 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 concentrates distillates um, uh, being being used. Uh, there's this is this is going on now. You know, we're, we're the, the UK are in the, the middle of building out uh, a bunch of uh, new uh, sites for extraction, uh, and that that's butane focused, uh, CO two focused, uh, pretty much every type of concentrate extraction process you you, you can imagine. Uh, we're building facilities to uh, move us towards what we hope is a, a, a better domestic market in a few years' time. Um, the importation of, of, of that in bulk, uh, I, th I think that that's, that's kind of tricky right now. I mean, the, the, so, so the, the way that things work in the UK, it's a named patient basis. So we bring in products uh, just for that patient and only for a, a month or two um of, of of prescription uh and it's, it's usually finished product so so I, I i don't see too much in the way of bulk concentrates for thc moving into the uk uh quite yet so i i see more uh flour or um um you know just dried dried uh bulk coming in so that we can extract that um, so that's what, that, that's the answer to that question. And then the first question you asked was, um, remind me of the first question, Andrew. You're on mute. We'll get to the first question. I apologize. We'll, we'll get to the first question in a second to, to finish this off. Um, I'll let Finn answer just the second part in terms okay. of APIs and this list. Okay. Cool. Um, so the, what we actually see is basically again, similar to Jonathan. I mean, we are using APIs in the market. Um, we actually want to do our finished medication that we want to develop at some point. It will be based on APIs. We see basically that extraction becomes more and more important for CBD and for THC. Um, and as the market is going away from the flower, <clears throat> I strongly believe that more and more companies will actually start extracting and creating isolates. Or um, actually also what we see is that there's also in Germany, um, but also especially in the US, there are more and more companies coming up that actually create synthesized um, or biosynthesized um, or want to create biosynthesized APIs. So I believe that this will be a, a big market. And I think because there are already some extractions in Europe and almost everyone that we know, for example, who built ex or who builds cultivation in Portugal or in other Southern Euro European companies and countries is also building up extractions. I believe that basically there will be at some point be a European market for produced APIs that are produced in the European Union. Um, and we see that growing and we basically believe in that. And that's the reason why we're also looking very closely on that market. Okay, that's a perfect transition to our last question before we finish off this panel, um, which is on the point of legalization. Is legalization uh, problematic uh, totally separate, you know, from, from the medical, from the medical industry, as we see in Canada, there's sort of a very, uh, undefined relationship in between the medical and the medical user and the recreational market in Canada is, is full legalization. Um, when is it, is it, is it close in Europe? And honestly, uh, what does it mean for the medical markets? Uh, and can they be separated? Yeah, I mean, I can actually answer that first because uh, I already mentioned that beforehand. Um, so I believe it can be close. It's really depending on, on um, first of all, it's really depending on if, for example, at some point Canada will say it was a good thing or not a good thing. And I think especially German politicians are very much looking into what Canadian politicians make, kind of what kind of experiences they make with the legalization. However, um, as you probably have heard, the Green Party in Germany is fully uh, pro-legalization, um, the liberals as well, um, and uh, the other parties are kind of undefined. The next government will probably not be without the Greens, um, and the Greens have at the moment 30% in the, in, the, in the polls, so between 20 and 30%. So basically, I see basically a very strong likelihood that maybe not a full legalization, but what I can imagine is that, for example, the German government will say, 
um, grown-ups over 21 years can basically get cannabis in the pharmacies. Um, and that is something that I, to be honest, see coming. We basically discussed also in the industry, um, among the industry players in, in Germany, of how we want to handle that. Are we for it? Are we against it? Uh, are, we, are we indifferent about it? So what you see in the US and also in Canada, wherever you legalize recreational cannabis, the medical um, sales go down. Um, so basically there are obviously always a gray zone of people who, who replace um, recreational with medical or the other way around. Um, I always find it very interesting that, for example, in Canada, all the Canadian companies who come to Germany into the German market, they actually um, show themselves as pharmaceutical companies that say we're medical. Um, but in, the, in Canada, for example, they also sell and basically market recreational brands. I find it somehow problematic. Um, <clears throat> I also think that German politicians will find it problematic. I don't know how it's in the UK or other markets. Um, also, there's the UN Narcotics Drug Convention saying that basically you shouldn't do the same, um, both. So I'm really curious of how this will be handled going forward, because on the, what I am also find somehow interesting is that on one hand, Germany is very strict on CBD, and on the other hand, they think about legalization of the full plant. Um, so that is actually something that I also find very interesting. So I think, to be honest, in Germany, there is no clear picture yet on how medical and recreational might be different from each other. I basically see at the end, the same companies doing it. Why? Because there needs to be quality insurance. There need to be basically um, infrastructure. There need to be supply. And only the medical companies as of today have all that. So I see basically that in the end of the day, the same companies, if it comes to legalization, will do both. However, it's a very interesting question how these companies will separate the medical arm from the non-medical arm. Because the way how it's done in Canada, I think it's, it's, it's somehow, yeah, um, a bit undefined. And I don't actually see how, how it will be better in Germany as of today. So just very, very quickly, from my perspective in the UK, um, well, firstly, uh, every, uh, every uh, political party in the UK believes that the um, drug reform policies of the last 40, 50 years have failed miserably. So um, with this new Conservative government, we will see a shift in, in uh, the approach to all drugs, not just cannabis. Um, personally, I think that we will do, do best moving towards a more decriminalised system. Uh, I think that there's there's very little chance of us seeing a recreational market um, within the next five years, within the next uh, political term. Uh, and I think probably the, the party that gets in after that, if they decide to change things, it will still take a few, a few years thereafter. Um, so drug reform will change. It may move to a, from what, to a more decriminalized uh, fashion. And all that's going to do is help the medical market. Because the, the issue we've got with the NHS who support um, our health system is they are looking at the number of pain patients that could come into this space and take expensive cannabis medicines from the NHS on a monthly basis. And they're seeing that figure in the millions and thinking this is going to cost us way too much. If we decriminalize, we see a huge drop in the number of patients that are looking for cannabis uh, for medical purposes. And I think as a consequence of that, we'll, we'll see a, a much, much better medical market. Gentlemen, this panel, we're on time. I absolutely appre appreciate um, y'all's intelligent and um, very diverse perspectives in this industry. And I, I assure that all the you know, people participating on this virtual conference appreciate deep insight onto the medical markets uh, that present in Germany as well as the UK. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you so much for joining us for this distribution panel. I think we're ready to go in terms of introductions. Um, so we'll start with Boris, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself to um, all the attendees. Sure, hi, my name is Boris Blatnik. I'm the CEO of CannaSwiss. Uh, we're a vertically integrated uh, extraction company based out of Switzerland. We've been around since 2014 and um, yeah, just celebrated our five year anniversary and ready for 2020. Thanks so much, Boris. Up next, we have Linus, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Linus speaking uh, from Germany. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Nimbus Health. Uh, we are a fully licensed pharmaceutical wholesaler here based in Frankfurt in the center of Europe. 
uh, with uh, our own warehouse facilities and an independent sales force to promote cannabis-based products to doctors and pharmacists. And uh, well, yeah, our mission is, as all of you guys probably, to supply seriously in patients uh, with the highest grade medicinal cannabis products from reliable sources. And this is the important stuff in a consistent and sustainable manner. Um, in, uh, indeed, we are offering training and education to doctors and physicians to bring the uh, best therapies uh, exchange with you to patients in Germany and the EU. Uh, and we are actively shaping the landscape, the pharmacy landscape in Germany. Um, as uh, one of the first distributors who promoted the network of cannabis pharmacies in Germany. Um, in this context, uh, we are also striving for standardization, professionalism and uh, expansion of cannabis as a medicine as the two speakers from the first panel. Thank you, for, thanks for having me, uh, the Cannabis Society and looking forward to a very interesting panel uh, with the other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linus. Up next, we have Mauricio. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mauricio Kraus. I am um, the founder of Econobis. Uh, we are a Colombian license holder. Uh, we were purchased by Plena Global Holdings and I'm currently the director of regulatory and government affairs and founder of the first Col uh, Colombian society of cannabis producers, uh, Asocolcana. Um, currently uh, we work uh, with, uh, we produce in Latin America and we've already started exporting to the EU and next would be Australia. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Next up we have Alexei. Yeah, hi everybody. Alexei Vikovsky here. I'm the founder of Alpha Green. Um, so Alpha Green is actually, I guess, a bit newer than some of the other panels here. Uh, it's an uh, integrated um, kind of medical wellness and later on also recreational play in Europe. Um, we funded by family offices and some tech entrepreneurs and our goal is to uh, build a curated marketplace in CBD and nutraceuticals uh, in Europe, uh, which is alphagreen.io and at the same time under the Alpha Green mat GmbH, we are in the process of getting the section 13 manufacturing and a wholesale and distribution license in Germany uh, in Dusseldorf. Um, Thank you so much. And the last uh, panelist that we have is Chana. Hello, uh, this is Hannah Greenberg. I work uh, for Brain Biceutical um, as VP Business Development. We're based in Sandwich, Kent in the UK, very close to the border with France. Uh, we produce um, EU GMP API for the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industry. Um, it's a phytocannabinoid. Um, and we are a company that's looking to produce and raise the standards that, that is available uh, for the consumer market, um, produce consumer wellness goods, our own branded nutraceuticals, as well as supply bulk API for use in clinical trials. We're currently in phase three clinical trials for refractory epilepsy in Brazil. Um, and looking to put our molecule in, in many other trials, participate hopefully in the French medical cannabis pilot and you know looking to um, expand expand out also supply currently to, to Brazil to the to the U to Canada and um, other parts of the globe and uh, thanks for letting, letting me be on this pilot, on this um, panel discussion Hannah, I'm gonna ask that you just turn on your your video so that we can see you oh otherwise okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that everybody else, sorry. Um, okay, well, uh, okay. it should be obvious to participants that our panel is well diversified from leading executives in Germany, Switzerland, uh, Colombia, and the UK. Um, to, to begin, I guess, let's start with sort of providing information. Uh, we'll start with you, Boris, in terms of um, the process to register products, whether that needs to be raw material or pharmaceutical products, and uh, the time frame of importing uh, cannabis of any sort into Switzerland, and then we'll go with each panelist. I'll slowly move forward in terms of the German market, which there are probably discrepancies, as well as the UK. 
okay, we agree it's the end. Um, I try to keep this as organized as possible just because I know there's a lot of panelists on here, but um, bear with me because there's a lot of information to cover. So Boris, sure. why don't you sort of just I'd start with the, the Swiss market, which is particularly unique to the European market. So maybe sort of you can talk to that effect as why yeah, Switzerland is. I, mean, I, can, I, can, I can talk a little bit about, you know, more on the, on the CBD and the other cannabinoids, THC, which great. That we don't really uh, play with um, at this moment in time. Um, when it comes to CBD uh, here in Switzerland, uh, most of you probably already know that the, 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 the flower itself has uh, been legalized since 2017 and uh, the consumption of uh, flour up to 1% THC is uh, completely permitted uh, here in Switzerland and also taxed uh, just as a tobacco product. When it comes to finished uh, goods, um, Switzerland is still uh, more or less abiding by the European uh, rules of uh, novel food. So it's a little bit complicated, let's say the big retailers aren't uh, putting CBD products onto the shelves, but they are selling them on their online portals. Um, to register products uh, here in Switzerland, it's, um, it's, uh, it's not something that most people do uh, as they do in Europe. In Europe, what we've, what we've done is essentially uh, gotten free passage to get our raw materials into Austria. And uh, that's a process that took about six, seven months uh, last year um, to, to essentially get our products tested. There's only one lab in Austria that does uh, official testing for, for the whole government. And um, yeah, so you basically just get in a queue and have to wait for, for, your, for your products to be tested. So we tested our distillate and our isolate. So those, those, pro those products um, get uh, free passage into Austria and from there we take it to a contract manufacturer and uh, we do all the filling and packaging under GMP uh, ISO conditions and then we distribute those products into the rest of Europe and, and the world. You're on mute. Thank you very much Boris. Uh, let's go with Linus next in terms of you know, what is the process for importing uh, raw materials and or uh, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredients to manufacture in Germany? Uh, what is the time frame um, for registering products and sort of what is you know, necessity in the German market to that effect? Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, well, that question is really uh, not easy to answer uh, because it, uh, first comes with uh, one thing it uh, really depends currently on the state where are you where you located in germany so we have uh, 16 different states uh, and nearly uh, yeah 21 different answers you get um, it's uh, there is currently no sp specific way the things which are uh, set are um, certain wholesale um, licenses you need so uh, in, it's the uh, paragraph 52a in Germany, which uh, allows you to be a pharmaceutical wholesaler, uh, which you need in order to enter the distribution business, as well as the narcotic uh, license, which is the uh, paragraph three of the narcotic law, um, which you need. But then uh, sort of the, uh, the hassle starts once again. It really depends on the product which you want to bring in. There are several different regulations. Let's do this example with the Betrocan flower, the most standardized flower in the, available uh, in a consistent way. Um, it's a radiated flower, uh, which is packaged by the Dutch government. Um, so it's really the Dutch government who is packaging the flour, irradiating the flour, and then exporting it. Um, so we don't have a direct contact to Betrocan uh, regarding this transaction. Um, the uh, irradiated flour needs an additional um, regulation or needs to fit to an additional regulation, and that regulation is uh, the MRADV. Uh, it's a, a regulation uh, which is handled by the bee farm. And the bee farm uh, is, uh, it's, it's basically a standardized process. It's a formality. However, it, you need to think of that when you bring in the products, for example, that are irradiated into the market. Um, well, uh, and this is, this is an easy way because we are inside Europe. Once it comes to the outside, you need um, an additional 
um, import license, otherwise only an import permit is needed. That import license needs to be requested and is also uh, different in every member or every state in Germany. Um, it, it's slightly aligned, um, but still uh, some are asking for different uh, uh, information than others. Um, in addition to that, um, that licenses are requested from different um, authorities. So the um, wholesaling license as well as the import license is always on the local authority and the, uh, for example, narcotic license then handled by the bee farm, uh, the uh, drug uh, administration agency in Germany. Uh, well, and once all this is set, uh, you're able to basically bring in the product from all over the world. Uh, it would be easy if uh, everyone would stick to the European GMP regulations. Um, and I just had a call this morning. It's, it's again what we've heard uh, with the authorities that EU GMP is really needed, even for the extracts, because they have now also requested the flowers which are used. So it's not uh, uh, reg regulated yet in a, in a manner that, uh, for example, GACP flower can be used. Um, I just asked this this morning uh, again, uh, because I think that this legislation or regulation might change in the future. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically it, uh, what I uh, can tell you how to enter the German market in this case, um, and um, how the licenses are distributed. There are a couple of things which need to be looked at, of course, again, like the registration in Germany, as well as the registration with the bee farm, and um, also uh, some other points which you have to look at, but this all comes up in the whole process where you're, uh, when you're in. Uh, so by requesting the first um, pharmaceutical license, you're uh, good to go. We know from some states, however, that they have now stopped giving out um, um, licenses uh, in terms of uh, pharmaceutical wholesaling licenses for uh, new requesters. Um, I don't know a reason for that, uh, but we've just heard that in some areas uh, it's like that. Thank you. Thank you, Linus. I'm actually going to then hop over to Alexei, who can discuss his perspective on the German market, uh, the process that he's going through right now as going to the distribution license application uh, and what he expects to do when importing flour, as you already have some LOIs already coordinated yourself. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Yes, so um, look, I mean, Linus was quite uh, complete there. Uh, it is indeed very de dependent on the state you're in. Um, actually, North Rhine-Westphalia, the, the biggest state in Germany, uh, right now has changed the rules, uh, for example, to Hessen, where Linus is in. So it's not enough to have the uh, Section 52 license anymore. You actually need the Section 13, which is a license slightly, well, more hustle kind of to, to go through. But ultimately, with that license, you have the also manufacturing license of controlled substances in place, in addition to the wholesale and distribution license. Uh, and that allows us to also, for example, label uh, products when we uh, distribute them to pharmacies. Um, and again, yeah, so there's some states, for example, you can't e even uh, get the Section 52 license anymore um, either. In terms of um, kind of supply, again, uh, right now, it's, it's very limited to players uh, who have the EU GMP uh, license to export and also kind of a, a third party audit from, uh, from, from kind of German auditors. Um, again, that's quite a limited amount of, of companies. There will be, of course, more companies uh, coming online with that uh, license to export, many of them in Canada. Uh, the Colombians are trying it as well. We actually have a few letters of intents. Um, Jacana, uh, the Jamaican player, obviously is looking to get the license in uh, Q2 and um, gave us a letter of intent as well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we, we, I think there is basically, yeah, quite a bit of uh, time still to go for for players who want to enter the German market to get a, a license, but it is becoming tougher. Um, it is becoming tougher, yeah. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, let's go to Mauricio, who can sort of jump in on regards to Colombia, because uh, I imagine that most of the German distributors are uh, diligent looking for products that are outside of the European market. Um, sort of talk about your process on moving products into the European market, where you've moved to, and the process that you need to go through to play in the, the overall European market, which is fragmented as we learned from the previous panel. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so 
we are, as you guys know, Colombia is an extract based uh, business or, or model. Uh, so here, about two years ago, we all started in this adventure. Uh, getting to what Europe needs uh, has always been very challenging, especially as the three panelists before said, EU GMP. Those five letters uh, are the biggest challenge for the Colombians um, because we're building. Uh, it takes time to, to get certified EU GMP. It takes time to bring a regulator from Germany or from any other country uh, that has um, the GMP uh, certifiers. Uh, so, so it is challenging, but we are getting there. And uh, we have proven that we can get product into Europe right now. Uh, currently, uh, obviously CBD is our big production because it's the easiest product to move. Um, in, in both in Germany and, and the Netherlands, which are the two countries which we have successfully delivered small amounts of the test shipments, uh, just so you know, it's not that we've delivered kilos, uh, we've delivered grams to understand the process. It's a very tricky process uh, because of the lack of definition at, on a global level. Um, but in Germany and the Netherlands, our experience was that CBD itself as an isolate, and an isolate form is not a controlled substance. So the process becomes a little bit more straightforward. We've uh, imported as technical grade, not for human use. Basically, it is for, for other distributors to finish the, the, the process or, or other LPs to finish the process within Europe. Um, our experience has been uh, tricky. What we've done is that we've worked a lot with our, with our, with our buyers uh, to understand the process. Again, uh, the lack of global standardization and laws becomes extremely tricky uh, in, in terms of us even, even define what is considered psychoactive or non-psychoactive cannabis. You know, in Switzerland, uh, as Boris knows, it's, it's much like Latin America. Below 1% of the flower is considered non-psychoactive. In the rest of Europe, obviously it's not. It's like more like the US. So this lack of, 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 of uniformity creates this challenge. That why CBD isolate is right now the product that we're moving. Um, in, in the process takes a long time. Um, most of the delays currently um, are due to either the import license of the buyer, but also of regulators in Colombia as they become more familiar with the product. In the three shipments that we've successfully delivered, two have been to Germany, uh, the cities of Dusseldorf and Frankfurt, and one has been to Amsterdam. In the three cases, uh, these, and, I, and I've sent a, approximately an average of 100, 150 grams of isolate. Uh, in the three cases, I had to go to the narcotics police, sit down with them, open the package. You know, it doesn't help that it's a white powder. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely, but, but, but it's get there. And, and it's a process of, of education, I would suppose. Um, the other thing that we've noticed is also the lack of knowledge from the importers. Uh, the European partners that we've uh, found are usually very familiar with importing raw materials or products within the EU. Uh, when, when going into other, uh, other jurisdictions, sometimes there's a big confusion. Obviously, it's all because of the lack of uniformity and laws. And um, last but not least, I mean, also, uh, we, we have received in Germany, we received in one of the shipments, um, and actually a revision from the Federal Opium Agency. So it's, it's, it's the processes that I guess uh, will become as, as they become more familiar with products coming out of Colombia. And last but last least, uh, our biggest challenge, to be honest, has been airlines, transporting through airlines. Uh, we've, we've done all the, the, the process with as, a, as a, any commercial export, but the airlines itself have been very, um, not very friendly with, with transporting the product. Uh, currently, we've only been working with one airline. It's a, the, the main German airline. It's the only one that has been open to us. Uh, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, currently, we're working both on a, per, on a like private company level and as an association level uh, to have technical tables with the airline associations and with the narcotics police to educate them a bit about the process. But mainly that has been our challenge. Uh, our, our main thing is we work with our clients uh, because as you all know, this is, uh, we're, we're still in the learning phase of this industry. And if we want to have a transparent transactions, we like to work directly with, with customers in this. Thank you, Mauricio. And Hannah, um, I guess let's focus a little bit about um, 
active pharmaceutical ingredients, which uh, your product is sort of a little different in terms of its ability to move across borders, being that's manufactured in the UK. But um, sort of talk about, you know, you know, you've discussed that you're looking to move your product across borders from Europe. Um, maybe you can talk to the effect about, you know, what it, what it means to export from the European market, what the active pharmaceutical ingredient um, product means for distribution as a narcotic and medical substance, uh, and whether or not it needs to be registered as such in the global markets. Anna? I think Unfortunately, lost. I think she has is not on right now, Andrew. Okay, so we'll come back to Hana momentarily. Um, being that everybody uh, is diligently looking for opportunities that exist um, within the re legal frameworks. Oh, hi, Hana. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Someone called and it, it just kind of cut me off, so I had to sign back in. No worries at all. I guess the question to pose to you, as we discussed before, which is, is as, as an active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturer, and you're looking to export materials across borders in the global marketplace. Can you talk about you know, what it means to be exporting materials from Europe uh, and, and the global marketplace? You know, what, what is the process for registering or do you need to register your materials as medical products being that they're active pharmaceutical ingredients? So I think as, as an API, um, it's slightly different than if you if it's a full spectrum product because it's MHRA, it's MHRA approved and an EU GMP inspected um, facility. So we produce special medicines, um, which we don't produce it ourselves, we produce it through Huddersfield Pharmacy Special. Um, and we also um, manufacture through contract manufacturers for the nutraceuticals market. But in terms of moving it across, Across borders, um, it's as as a, as an API for for CBD. It still needs to be until we we until we receive our exempt exempt product status from the Home Office. We are restricted, and we are at the last the last <coughs> that those three arms of of the regulation regulation is, are met. So we're almost there. Okay, thank you very much. I guess. The next question I, I want to focus on is mutually recognized agreements and what that means for moving product from, from um, Europe into Canada and or Australia or Australia to move products into Europe or Israel uh, and or products coming from Africa, whether or not Colombia itself is under, un, you know, understood under the mutually recognized agreement and what that means because of EU GMP, those big five letters as Mauricio has uh, diligent, diligently you know, provided to us. Um, let's talk a little bit about mutually recognized agreements and what that means for UGMP. I guess uh, let's start with, with Linus in terms of your, because you sort of touched on that, whether or not it really needs to be EU GMP or product under uh, a mutually recognized agreement can move into the European market and what that means. Linus, you're on mute. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, um, as I said, UGMP, and I didn't mention or similar uh, because we uh, uh, are in partnering with Althea in Australia, an extract company, and we are uh, setting up the process to bring in um, cannabis extracts into Germany. Um, and this is exactly the question uh, what is asked. So we have a mutual recognition, uh, recognition agreement between the European Union and Australia. And it works fine. It's the GGA 93, which is accepted. However, it's also accepted. Uh, it needs to be accepted for the flower material. So, um, and that's exactly the case I mentioned in the beginning that uh, they, uh, Bee Farm in Germany, requests exactly the um, um, the licenses uh, under EU GMP or TGA 93 um, of the uh, extracting company uh, of the manufacturer and also of the manufacturer of the initial flower uh, cannabis floss. Um, so um, it's always uh, that the bee farm requests this in order to sort of see where that product is coming from. And this product needs to come, of course, still from a uh, agency, which is um, yeah, a state agency, which releases the product for that specific purpose, uh, the purpose to send it to Germany. Um, and that's uh, working for Australia and it's, uh, 
uh, a good thing. Um, so it works between EUGMP and TGA93. Now you are on mood. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to switch over to Boris, who can provide information on the Swiss MRA and what that means for moving product uh, into the EU. Um, you know, whether performing clinical trials in Switzerland is advantageous if anything related to active pharmaceutical ingredients related to CBD. Again, I think with the Swiss, I'm going to be uh, you know, focusing on the CBD market. Um, maybe you can sort of talk about that, what, that, what, what Swiss mutually recognized agreement means for Switzerland as an advantage, even though you have one, up to 1% THC to be a credible product. Yes, I mean, it, it is quite uh, advantageous, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because uh, getting finished products into the EU is not that simple. Um, since we can't register our products into the EU, uh, we basically have to then uh, produce it, uh, package it in the EU, uh, going through Austria, as I mentioned before, and then we can have the, pro the products registered. What we're doing now is going through the novel food application, which we've been doing now for three years here in Switzerland, and we're really in the final stages. And we're hoping that the EU will um, recognize uh, novel food Switzerland as it follows the same guidelines as, it, as, as in Europe, uh, so that we can then um, legally sell our products um, you know, on the shelves in the EU. So this is something that's still to be determined. We'll see if that happens. But in any case, I think that uh, having novel food um, approval from the Swiss authorities um, will give us, a, let's say, a leg up uh, with, with EFSA in, in, in the EU and also with the FDA in the United States. You're on mute again, Andrew. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, thank you for everybody being patient with regards to the meeting process that we're all going through. Um, Mauricio, how about you sort of provide insight in terms of, you know, the challenges you face as not being an MRA country, but um, where does that mean in terms of you moving your product through Australia and then um, to that effect? Is there, is, is Plena looking at um, producing in other places that, you know, may, may be under MRA or or are you really truly just go into the diligent process to become an EU GMP certified company? Well, we are, we are looking for partners uh, that uh, we can export to and, 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 and actually they can do the finished product. My main concern right now is that our partners have a narcotic raw material license. Uh, we see this as the easiest access to get into those markets. Um, but to, your, to, to answer your question regarding Plana, we are looking into doing EU GMP ourselves here in Colombia um, because we see these in the long run as, uh, I mean, the economics behind producing in LATAM is, is I mean, there's, there's no question to that, especially in a product like CBD, which I strongly believe that it will be commoditized before, that we, before, before then we think uh, in, in what we all thought. So in, in that sense, I think that um, uh, we do want to get into EU GMP so that we can have access to a global market. I mean, that's how, how, that's how we look at it. It is a little bit more expensive. It's time consuming. That's why right now we are just working as technical grade and, and exploring partnerships uh, with uh, the narcotic raw material. The narcotic raw material. Thank you. I'm going to pivot now to, to our next question and open up with Khana in terms of focusing on um, the opportunity that exists for um, the European, the, in the previous panel, I guess I'm backtracking, I apologize. The previous panel, as we discussed, there is an advantageous opportunity for producers, cultivators, and manufacturers in Europe. Um, and that's really what, you know, the European advantage to that, to that regard. Um, in the UK right now, there's unfortunately so many buyers of API bulk materials uh, as there would be in, say, Germany and or the Swiss market. But in the Swiss and, and or German market, there are less API manufacturers. Um, do you see your product long-term being an exported focus business model, or is it going to be domestically focused on the UK as more CBD isolate is needed for the domestic market? So I think as, um, yeah, I'm not on mute. Um, as, as we stand right now, um, coming towards the end of the year, there's a massive um, kind of rush to, to source our 
our API isolate. And um, we are launching a lot of products for the UK market. <clears throat> I, think, I, think, I think the focus as novel foods, as novel food regulation kicks into the UK, there will be a push towards, um, towards, towards the higher standards of uh, consumer products um, until, until other, other companies are novel foods compliant. Um, Brains has an act active substance medical file, which should help us to become compliant quite quickly. Um, in terms of toxic toxicity and safety, as I mentioned earlier, we're in phase three trials um, outside of the UK, but it shows that our, it will, it will it, those that data will stand um, as as a safety data. And I think I just think that there's a very large push, and and there was a recent YouGov study conducted by the CMC that showed there are 1.4 million patients currently using. CBD in the UK for medical uses, um, and that translates that to a significant number um, that that will be looking to source quality consumer products. And if and once our API consumer products become available, I think a lot of our a lot of our current production will focus on the UK market. Okay, so my question now goes back to Alexei, who can discuss you know. In Germany, there are very limited cultivators. There are only three different licensed tenders in Germany. Uh, all the flour that you'll be looking to import and or, or extract materials, uh, anything will be brought in from other countries. Do you see Germany uh, opening up more opportunity for a domestic focused cultivation and extraction or manufacturing of bulk materials opportunity? Um, and if so, what does that mean for your LOIs or the arrangements that you have with other companies that will be, you know, um, bringing in product from the international markets? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, our assumption is that the market in Germany is growing and will reach 1 million patients in 2024. That means in consumption terms, we're looking at around 44 tons consumed uh, per year in, in, in 2024. 20, uh, Right now, we are around four tons consumed. Um, if you look at the 13 lots the German government gave to three companies, Afri, Aurora, and Domacan, um, they account for 650 kilos a quarter, and they're then allowed to grow 10% every uh, year uh, from that. So let's assume even in a, in a perfect scenario where they manage to actually grow the crop and it doesn't, um, it doesn't you know, Kind of, you know, it's 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 ready to sell and it's of high quality. Uh, you're looking, let's say, at a maximum of five to ten tons uh, by 2024 locally produced. Uh, that includes, let's say, maybe new tenders being written out by Germany. Um, you then have Vedrocan, which, as Lena said, is right now the the majority supplier of cannabis into Germany. Uh, they currently have six tons and presented actually in London at a conference showing that another four tons of capacity is coming online. So that's, let's say, 10 tons. And actually, if you look at Bedrican, they have a cap of 100 kilos per year they can export to a country. Now, of course, they're exporting more than two tons right now to Germany. And that's because it was a special request from Germany and because other medical markets are quite small in Europe. Uh, but let's even assume you continue to have two and then later maybe up to five tons of Vedrica material going into Germany. That gives you 15 tons um, in Germany. And that, gives, that leaves you still with more than, uh, well, close to 30 tons of deficit, which then needs to be filled by the likes of, you know, Plena, et cetera, and whoever wants to kind of serve Germany. Obviously, that includes the current a UGMP uh, licensed players such as you know Aurora, Kronos, etc. Uh, but again, there will be always the need for uh, for import into Germany. And then your second part of the question in terms of extraction and kind of whether Germany builds out the whole infrastructure uh, themselves in in the country. I, again, I'm not too familiar with the extraction uh, licensing process in Germany. However, I did see quite a few decks. Uh, lending on my table uh, from extraction players who are setting up German extraction uh, facilities. And their argument is that actually in Germany, you don't need a license to do extraction. Um, again, probably depends on whether it's THC or CBD extraction. Um, that was more about the CBD extraction, not the THC. Um, 
So again, even if Germany, if, even if there are a few players then setting up extraction facilities, the, the sheer amount of consumption by the, by the German patients, pool of patients will require always a, a, a kind of a, an import market. And also I think in terms of extraction, there will be still uh, products which need to be imported from Switzerland, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you very much. Like I say, I guess Boris, um, sort of, I'm going to pivot the conversation just to sort of focus on the Swiss market, particularly in CBD, which is um, what's the opportunity in the domestic market in Switzerland? And is there a need to import raw materials or extracts? You know, I know a number of companies are moving product, whether from Colombia uh, or even Italy, into the Swiss market. Um, is that also a long term trend or is it going to be more? Swiss players focus on Swiss cultivation and Swiss extraction uh, to focus on domestic use and or to then move product from Switzerland to the international markets um, sort of in the next stage. I think uh, it will all depend on the business model of the companies here in Switzerland. Uh, for us particularly, we um, are really uh, focused on you know, Swiss made. So everything from seed to set to, to finished product um, has to be done here in Switzerland. For the meantime, I mean, I, I, I can imagine us probably importing uh, biomass from other parts of the world um, as production uh, costs are going to be a lot cheaper. Um, also, I can, I can maybe in some of the equatorial countries around the globe, I could grow uh, three or four harvests a year. So I can have a continuous um, supply of fresh material that I can extract and, and, and then subsequently finish uh, here um, in Switzerland. Uh, of course, there's other companies that I think, you know, are always looking at um, producing their products as cheaply as possible. So they might be uh, buying the isolate or distillate from, you know, the US or potentially Colombia in the future, in the near future, um, you know, and, uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. Um, but again, I mean, I think you know the the whole the whole idea of Swiss made it kind of sells itself, and that's something that we strongly believe in and and uh, will will pursue. Thank you. So to Mauricio, in terms of that question, um, Clint is focused on a B two B model, exporting flour in terms of right now prerogative. Or is there really a lot of potential to focus? purely on cultivation for domestic use and purpose, whether to provide for B2B and or to B2C in Colombia. Um, most of the Colombians right now are trying to ramp up for purposes of exportation, even though if they're not under EU GMP standards, um, they're limited there, or you know, maybe there's an opportunity to move products into Australia or other markets. Um, but really, you know, what's the potential domestically in, in Colombia and, and will there be uh, a deficit in Colombia because everyone's so focused on exportation? Uh, good question. And it's funny that you just asked me that because somebody here in me on my office asked me literally the same question. Um, I think that the potential of flowers in Colombia is huge. Uh, and when the business, when the industry opened up in this country, uh, most of the players, including ourselves, uh, we applied for a vertical integration. Uh, as time progresses, we understand where our capacities and our strengths are. And we focus on that, at that point of the value chain where we're good at and where we can actually provide positive um, uh, input towards the industry. On in that sense, uh, I have to say that a lot of, a lot of people have, uh, have not successfully been uh, cultivating in mass scale and they're looking for supply. Uh, I know this because obviously we do get a lot of calls from domestic players. Uh, so yes, we are partnering up and our focus right now, especially in the sense of flour, is to focus on the domestic market. Uh, what our business model basically right now, we are dividing part of our fields exclusively for the domestic market and the creation of flour, and then part of our field for just extracting isolates. Uh, obviously, we have uh, R&D as we develop new products and as, as the law permits us exports of other products or we get clients that can import our products, uh, but currently, yes, it, it, it's the biggest market. And I could even dare to say, uh, after running some numbers, uh, it, currently, it's a lot 
a lot more revenue producing to sell flowers domestically than to export isolate with how the price is in the international markets. So uh, we are focusing on that. Uh, our business model is based on our current the greenhouse, sorry, that we built uh, is one of the highest tech greenhouse, if not the highest tech greenhouse is LATAM. And uh, what we're doing is we're guaranteeing the top-notch quality flower for the domestic markets. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pivot. We've now added um, Tom Zuber also onto the discussion um, to focus a little bit about trends in 2020. Um, but also for just what we're, you know, since the predominant majority of the people in the room are you know, distributors and are manufacturers of particular products. Um, while there's an opportunity right now to uh, separate yourself by having material available, right? Uh, in the future, as more companies become live in UGMP, and, and there's more products available. Uh, I'm going to state my own opinion that I'm willing to wager that having proprietary products, whether they be um, formulated end products and distributing formulated end products and or proprietary genetics. Um, I guess let's start with um, Boris in terms of that regard, which is, you know, is that what will set you apart in the long term is having something that's a trademark and or proprietary product, whether it be raw material like a genetic and or from an end product, is that what will set you apart from the rest in terms of you know, not getting caught between the Africans and Latin Americans who will be looking to commoditize this product in the future? It depends. I mean, if you're talking about raw material, um, yes, but it's going to be very difficult to, to uh, patent or trademark um, you know, CBD isolate, for example, or CBC as a raw molecule. We have to make some uh, changes to that. Uh, we've been in talks with a company that makes uh, an ingredient, um, and um, basically we're we're doing clinical trials right now in South Africa to see if you know our ingredient plus their ingredient, hopefully the one plus one equals three. Um, they've done a lot of clinical trials, one company, and uh, we're working together to see if we can make, let's say, an enhanced CBD or an enhanced cannabinoid. Um, and then uh, patent it to the market and uh, put it onto the market with, with, uh, with studies uh, proving its, its efficacy. So that's something that uh, we're, we're working on now. But um, I think what, what uh, you know, if you're a brand, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be so focused on having a patent per se, because anybody can more or less copy what you're doing and, and just change one or two things and, 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 and come out with something a little bit different and then you're not infringing on anybody's patent. Tom, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm right. Um, but I think what sets companies apart at the end is, is uh, their ability to, to set themselves apart with uh, the look and feel, um, being able to, you know, be highly focused on exactly what the demographic is of who your clique uh, client is going to be. Um, you know, I think you, you kind of have to create an avatar of exactly who you're looking to sell uh, you, uh, to, um, you know, is it a woman, is it a man, what their age is, what uh, car they drive, uh, what they do, what's their morning ritual, etc. I mean, you have to go down to the final detail. And once you understand who your, your key demographic is or your key person is that you're going to be marketing to, then, then you can build a brand that, that, that targets that that exact demographic. And hopefully that demographic will then be able to become a, uh, a raving fan of your product and of your brand and will continue um, promoting it through their own uh, word of mouth or I don't know, some, something else. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, brands, um, I think they're, they're missing uh, key components, which is you know the ability to speak to the end customer and set a tone of well it depends on what you're trying to sell but you know if you're selling uh, wellness goods i don't think it's uh, uh advantageous to have a very loud uh packaging that uh, scares your your key demographic away you have to maybe uh, promote the sense of calm and trust and um i think a lot of the brands out there are not doing that right now so this is we're, we're moving into actually what we're because it's been time on the panel, we're actually going to move into our interactive discussion. When we have everybody on the panel, I want people to really, you know, this is an opportunity to ask each other questions, sort of comment and or disagree with each other. 
Um, and so Tom, you know, I just, you know, jumping off with what, what Boris said just for you to open up the discussion, you know, is there an opportunity for distributors to, to focus on you know, trademark products, intellectual, you know, proprietary genetics? Um, you know, what is that, what, what is, what is, where is the position for intellectual property and the commodities perspective in the global marketplace being that most people focus on raw material distribution to new markets? I guess you can open this up and, you know, say, state your positions and people can sort of comment to, to your expertise. Tom? I think we lost. Yeah, it looks like Tom, unfortunately, has dropped off. Okay, so <laughs> I guess um, I, Anna... I, Yeah, I'd like to make a comment about that. I, yeah. think, I think ultimately um, um, the previous speaker was correct in terms of, of having the avatar, but ultimately the, your avatar has to really be, become a, a, a complete fan, not just the packaging, but in terms of where people are using this as a, as a medicine and a wellness product. So the active ingredient, if it actually produces them a well a wellness and improved wellness and for whatever that for whatever reason they're taking it for improved sleep less less stress um if it's a skin product if it's if it's a muscle balm they the the ultimate end game is do, is there an, is this an effective active product inside and the regulations that will which i think is determining making sure that there is consistency of product dosing that the patients know how to dose themselves because the the content is consistent um and it's and, and the molecule and the product works for whatever the purpose is that the, the patient or the, or the, or the consumer is taking it okay um alexa alexa yeah why don't you sort of come into that regard because you've got also the cbd e-commerce platform you know so you're you're Talk to that effect in terms of you know. exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. So we actually we actually see already. I mean, this is the wellness side. It's uh, nothing to do with medical, um, and ultimately, it's of course part of a story. And and ultimately, when the recreation market one day gets launched, we, we can then move there with with the online bit and the physical bit from the medical. But what we see on the wellness side is that packaging does actually matter quite a lot. I mean, we have quite a few brands already, and you can see that quite a few brands are being sold better than the other ones, even though the, the product has almost the same ingredient. Um, I would say on the recreation market, um, looking at Canada or California or the US in general, you can also see there are quite a few dominant brands and they have a very kind of unique packaging and they have lots of kind of, you know, special strains and therefore it makes probably sense to IP it. IP these strains and these kind of you know formulations. I would say on the medical uh, market, I actually don't see a need for now uh, to do any IP. I mean, I mean, there is maybe a need, but I would say it doesn't really make a difference. I mean, the point is there's so little product in the market that people go a lot, obviously, for the bedrocon market, a bedrocon product, which is actually well known for not being the best tasting, let's say, product but again the patients don't really care about the taste there they care about you know getting a solution for their pain um, or for the epileptic um, conditions um, therefore kind of IP and maybe packaging is, is less important in the, in the medical uh, market um, again if you look at Canada if you look at uh, the US or Israel uh, a lot of the medical products again you can't really differentiate them and yet they're still being still being bought whereas uh, in the recreational and the wellness market um, you definitely see a big need for uh, a unique packaging a new unique brand and then probably also some sort of IP not just around the, the brand and the trademark but also uh, looking into the kind of flavors you know the strains etc etc yeah I agree with that and we, we, we are launching in, in March um, in the wellness market and we have a few different SKUs um, and because uh, for example um, CBD has been delisted from WADA so um, sports and kind of pre-Olympics um, we are working with some NFL teams now and I think you're right about uh, packaging and branding and, and um, key influencers and for, for people for consumers who want to kind of follow it excuse me, follow their heroes um, who are using a top, a top grade ingredient and the, the branding for sports, for example, is, you're right, I, I do agree with what you're talking about, that they are leading, they're going to be leading brands with, with top ingredients and top um, 
kind of oh, famous thanks. music. Thanks. And, and Tom, in terms of the fact that we've been talking about, you know, we've been focused on you know, the materials themselves being proprietary uh, as potentially an, an interesting opportunity for distributors and you know, what that means for the wellness market, sort of, you know, uh, the process to, to, you know, to trademark, you know, genetics, I mean, genetics themselves or the strain names, whether it's being sold as an end product or going through the process to intellectualize, uh, you know, genetics themselves, you know, what does that, what does that mean to the European market and how complicated is it across, you know, the person in the U.S. or Canada? So, well, that, that's a big question and, and you can attack it from <laughs> yeah. a, a number of different angles. So first of all, let's talk about the technology component of things and, uh, and, and uh, thereby the, the patent component of, of that question. Uh, so, uh, of, of course, the types of protection vary throughout the world. Uh, in the United States, we have what's called the U.S. plant patent, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's its own peculiar thing. And you have uh, uh, a, a sort of version of that in the European Union, which allows you to protect uh, plant varieties, but it, it's actually quite different than the U.S. plant patent protection. So our law firm is on the cutting edge at, on, on all fronts. We obtained as an example, the second ever issued U.S. plant patent for a cannabis strain. Um, but, but the bottom line is that you can protect this plant from, a multiple, uh, from multiple angles. So you can protect it as a, from the genetic standpoint. You can protect it from uh, a plant variety standpoint. You can also protect it from a, a utility patent standpoint. So uh, as an example, uh, you can protect a, a particular plant fingerprint uh, as, as compared to a particular physiological condition that that plant fingerprint will achieve on a particular human physiological condition. Uh, and you can also patent, for instance, the means of uh, uh, distributing uh, the contents of a plant into the human physiology. So for instance, delivery devices and processes and so many other things here. So the general uh, uh, phrase here, uh, I think that's applicable that I often use is I believe that there's more technology inside this plant and between the plant and human physiology than there is in the pharmaceutical industry as a whole. And we represent two of the biggest pharmaceutical industry uh, uh, industry companies in the world. So, uh, so that's a pretty big statement, but I firmly believe it. Then we do a lot of cutting edge work in this space. Uh, when you start talking about, uh, I, I think, uh, Andrew, you were also asking about, well, uh, if you have a plant strain, can you trademark that? And the answer is maybe it gets really funky, uh, in kind of a fun way for a lawyer and kind of a, I guess a challenging way or a frustrating way for anybody else. Uh, but, uh, what it comes down to is, is that strain name generic? Right. So over time, if if I if I have a name, I'll call it strain X uh, to avoid offending anyone. Um, but let's say strain X is, is the, the means of referring to a particular strain. And that's uh, in the beginning. Maybe that's a trademark. But over time, uh, others begin to use the, the, the name strain X to describe the strain and other strains like it. Uh, and then uh, there's a lack of enforcement on the part of the person who actually in the first instance own. Uh, the, the, the mark strain X. At that point, it becomes generic because it merely describes uh, the, the, a, a type of cannabis strain in the way that the word car describes a, a car. And so uh, nobody at that point can own the name strain X in relation to the strain if it belongs to the public. So a key thing is to be aware of that dichotomy. The fact that a famous example here uh, uh, in the United States uh, is uh, Xerox, right? Um, so Xerox obviously is a, is a, is a powerful a uh, moniker, uh, but over time, people began to refer to uh, use the word Xerox to refer to the process of making a copy of something, and that was a dangerous thing for the mark, actually. So uh, it was actually a function of its success uh, that that uh, really endangered ownership of the mark. And something similar can happen with strains, right? So it's important to recognize that there's a difference between describing a strain and owning a brand, and you want to make sure that you're always leaning as the owner of a brand toward owning the brand and toward resisting that notion of allowing it to become descriptive in regard to describing a particular strain. And I hope that that was helpful. That was very helpful. Marisha, just sort of get you involved in this conversation, you know, what does that mean for a commodities focused company doing the B2B model, you know, in terms of you guys are going to be cultivating, what does that mean? Is it going to be just focused on price and, you know, what the market needs? Are you guys looking to sort of differentiate yourselves from the other Colombians by focusing on uh, having products that, you know, whether it's a unique extraction process or an extremely unique cultivation process that, you know, sort of sets you apart from the other ones? Well, obviously, we want to differentiate, differentiate ourselves uh, by quality. Uh, I see this market in a long-term run, uh, meaning that for us, quality is consistent supply on scale and on spec. Um, so that's, that's what we're focusing on, making sure that we 
uh, create varieties uh, or, or, you know, that right now we're just working with what we call a uh, um, seed source that, that we had from international countries and from Colombia. We gathered a bunch of seeds and we're registering them. These seeds, we're creating a breeding program. Our idea would be able to have propriety on a genetic that we can basically cultivate like we cultivate corn or you cultivate uh, sugar cane, you know, a big machine on seeds and you consistently get the same the same uh, variety uh, with a uh, 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 good control in, in terms of, of um, the atmosphere you know we want to get the lowest possible capex uh, so so in that sense that's how we want to differentiate ourselves uh, that's where we would like to get our propriety and our genetics uh, I do see this in the long term uh, and, 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 and the value of this industry is in the IP of the, of the genetics in, in the end. Uh, that's where I see where we have to develop. And then just to everybody in terms of going through and, you know, discussing, you know, what, 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 what would be the ideal model for standardization in Europe? You know, what would, what does that look like? And what does that mean for patient access? And what does that mean for the commodities play? I guess just, you know, just throw it out there. Um, uh, I like say, you know, what is, what is, what is, what, what would be the best Europe cannabis industry for you? And then, you know, I'll let everybody sort of comment, comment, you know, from there. What would be the best what, sorry? European market, the model, the regulatory standardization, you know, what do you want to see from 2020? Like, what do you need to thrive as a business from the European market? From What would you tell the regulators, the other businesses, practices, directly the patient, you know, what do you want to see in 2020? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the German model is quite good. Um, obviously, it would be better to have some sort of alignment between the different states. Um, but on the other hand, again, that creates kind of a barrier to entry and therefore it enables, um, you know, the, the existing players to, uh, to, to survive long and take a bigger piece of the market rather than make it very easy and, you know, kind of the way it happened in Canada or, or the U.S. kind of, you know, everybody can kind of apply and then it's the lottery system. Um, in terms of standardization, again, because there are so many regulatory steps one has to go through, um, you know, the pharmacies can be quite certain that the product is of some sort of good quality, given that every uh, distributor, at least under section 13, has to have a QP in place as well, which is the person checking off uh, the labels and the, and the quality of the a product uh, we import from, you know, be it Bedrocan or from Canada. Um, so again, right now, I think the German model is quite good. Denmark is following a similar model, I would say. Um, I think if I would be a Canadian player, I would probably uh, try to improve the fact that, uh, you know, you shouldn't have the government or the, the agency uh, between the consumer and, and the supplier and therefore allow uh, producers to actually sell directly almost to consumers as well. Um, I think in Germany, if you look at uh, Aurora Afria, Demokan, uh, the guys who got this cultivation license, um, Afria and Aurora actually have a distribution play and so they will actually be able to have that vertical integration in Germany. Uh, compared to the same names in Canada don't actually have that vertical integration. And I think the, the, one of the reasons you had this massive sell-off in the equities market in Colombia, oh, sorry, in Colombia, in Colombia too as well, by the way, but sorry <laughs> to put you there, but um, in, in Canada and the US especially, because you had so much material produced, so much inventory sitting there finished, unfinished, and the government being, government being just very slow in handing out retail licenses and therefore limiting the legal market to sell actually uh, legally through the retail chains. And I think that there's a massive example where kind of regulation uh, went a bit wrong and I think they are trying to sort it out now. But I would say in Germany, um, I, it's not easy, but I actually think that's kind of the right way. Boris, what are your thoughts in terms of what Alexei is saying? And, you know, what's the best European market for you as a Swiss company? What do you want to see from the European market? Any um, I mean, comments you have to Alexei's point? Yeah, you know, what do you agree or disagree with? I mean, I would love to, to see uh, one of the countries here in Europe legalize cannabis. I think that will give a little ripple effect into the rest of the EU. Um, 
I would love to see uh, novel food or at least regulations be put in place that will stay stable, um, that won't change from uh, every couple months, um, you know, regarding CBD and these other cannabinoids. Um, those are, I think, my basic wish list for, for 2020. <laughs> Um, you know, and obviously a little bit more acceptance to, 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 the, to the plant. But I think this will only come once the studies have come out. I think that's one, one of the questions um, that you had planned for, for, this, for this panel. Um, but you know, once, once these um, clinical trials come out and prove the, the effectiveness for certain ailments, uh, I think there'll be a new sort of uh, interest in, in taking um, you know, these various cannabinoids and various ratios to help you with <laughs> And Tom, you know, as an American lawyer with clients across the globe, what do you want to see in the European market? Are you, you looking and hopefully, you know, hoping that, you know, the, 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 the standardized regulations meet between, you know, hopefully legalization in Europe and we can trade product between European countries and, the, you know, in the United States, you know, as a lawyer, what's the best opportunity for your clients? And what do you want from the European market? Uh, as a lawyer in the industry and, and also as uh, someone with uh, an awful lot of under God friends in the industry, I, I think that I, along with everybody else on this call, benefits when the industry as a whole thrives. Uh, so learning lessons from around the world, uh, I'd say that it's in your interest to focus on the illegal market that's going to grow alongside the legal market and to focus on taxation. So certain jurisdictions in the world have been awfully aggressive on overtaxing. Uh, legalized cannabis industries, and then on regulating uh, the, the companies that are compliant and trying to be compliant. And in the meantime, an illegal market uh, thrives because they don't pay taxes uh, and they don't have to comply with regulations. It's important to find a balance because uh, as an example, uh, here in, in, well, I'm actually in our New York office today, but in, in California, where I'm typically based, uh, the, uh, uh, the illegal market, by some estimates, makes up 80% of the California cannabis market. Uh, so that's obviously a mature market in the United States, the most mature market uh, in some respects. Uh, but uh, that's, that's not unusual. And uh, that will happen in Europe because there's too much money involved. So again, I would come back to it. Uh, I would focus on enabling licensed cannabis producers in Europe to thrive and to do that by uh, exercising dis discipline in terms of taxing uh, cannabis companies. You don't have to try and squeeze out that extra buck uh, because you want uh, the, the licensed cannabis companies that are paying taxes at all to, to grow uh, and, and, and thereby produce, uh, incidentally, more revenue, tax revenue. And also, uh, in addition to enforcing regulations on licensed cannabis companies, it's important to enforce the law on unlicensed cannabis companies. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's I, I think, what I'd like to see most of all, because I think that that is the single biggest barrier uh, to uh, the, the growth of the European cannabis industry. Hanuk, uh, I know you have, you know, comments to, sort of to that, to that regard in terms, you know, in the UK with, you know, which is a massive, you know, uh, black market and unfortunately everything with the CBD and even the CBD products are unregulated, right? Um, and unenforced, you know, what's your sort of your comments to that, to Tom's points in that regard? So I, I you know, I totally um, endorse what Thing about about um, the safety and and getting acceptance of the plant. And I think I think my thoughts were I'd like to kind of just answer the question slightly differently. I think it's what does the what does the industry need from us, from us LPs, from us people in the space? How can we how can we support the the difficult file that there is? Um, and I'm sure that the regulators want want to. Um, create safe access for patients and for users of CBD who choose to, whether it be a wellness product or that it's a quasi medical product until they're able to get it um, as, as, a, as a licensed medicine. And I think what they want from us is to raise those global standards so it's a safe, effective product, which is, all, and pricing, I think just the, you know, the pricing needs to be priced, it needs to be um, well sourcing, everything needs to be kind of, um, fair fair for the consumers fair for the fair for the producers and in order to do that we need to be you know just consistently honest and and produce safe products and 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 work closely with the regulators to make sure that they get the um support they need and they can create um, effective regulation that, uh, that improves access and and like you said 
supports acceptance of the plant, but they'll only, the regulators and the governments will only do that when they can see that we are being compliant and we are being, we are being um, responsible with what we supply to the market. Absolutely, and Mauricio, you obviously face more, you know, uh, not criticism, let's use the word, you know, uh, uh, concern, but, you know, in terms of the stigma of being a Colombian company, you know, and you as an advocate, you know, and uh, I know that you've championed, you know, opportunities in the Colombian market yourself. Um, you know, what do you want to see in the European market to Takana and Tom's points in terms of, you know, uh, these legal models, you know, as a Colombian company, what does that mean for you? Well, uh, the most important thing that I have in my wish list and that I see as a, as a big concern, and it's for everybody here, it's not only for the Colombian producer, um, is standardization and rules. Uh, in order to have a, a mature commercial uh, industry uh, where we can actually export and we can take advantage of our, each country's different qualities, you know, you got great research and, 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 and a great market in, in, in the EU, uh, here in LATAM or in the equatorial countries, we can have a extremely low cost production. So if we join forces and, and there's a, 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 a creation of standardization in export and import rules, uh, uniformity and definitions, uh, that's what's going to really get this market mature and, and, and get all of us uh, having a real conversation on how we can all collaborate and make sure that ultimately patients get what they need. Isn't that why we're all here? Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually issue. You know, I'm gonna open it up for everybody, you know, in the closing remarks. Um, we talk about what we want, but what is the reality now? And what are the expected trends in 2020 based on the way they currently are today? Mauricio, I guess you'd open up back to you and then we'll work backwards. You know, what, what, what does 2020 mean for you actually as a company? Well, 2020 for us uh, means actually uh, being able to export uh, large quantities to Europe, uh, not only isolate. I, I want to see. I want to be able to export, uh, and and we're all, and we're already moving forward to that in in in, in um, full spectrum oils and and distillates, um, mostly CBD dominant. Uh, THC right now we are in Colombia. Uh, Colombia as a government works very strict representation of the INCB board in terms of quotas. Uh, so in order for us to be able to cultivate commercially THC products, we have to have a clear view of the final product that we're going to sell and the customers being uh, yourselves, the European market, uh, what they require for us to produce in THC levels. So this is a longer process. Uh, so uh, we see this more and towards the end of Q4 in 2020. Uh, but yeah, for us is is an, an expansion. Um, Plan is also the the biggest footstep right now. It's going to be Peru. Peru is opening up, and it's an amazing market uh, because of the geographical condition. Uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with that area, but it's basically a desert. So the plant thrives amazingly in outdoor. So very very little capex. I mean, if I'm producing here per gram, my cost is around ten cents. In Peru, I can get it down to between four to five easily. Wow, and Hanna, honestly, what you know, 2020 for you, uh, what, what's expected of brains, biocidicals, and you guys just goes around and make also room for expansion. Everybody, I think, is getting ready yeah. to ramp up for 2020. Yeah, well, we, we, we just announced um, literally last, uh, last weekend um, the finalizing of our first round, and that will enable us to roll out production sevenfold from 680. 680, approximately 680 to 6,900 kilos of CBD API. And um, we've just partnered with Altis Living Labs, which is for elite performance of athletes and, um, and soldiers. And I think that building up of the brand around sports leading up to the Olympics is going to be um, a very big, a very big skew for us, uh, which I'm particularly excited about because I'm a bit of a sports fan myself who's had injuries and um, have actually actively been looking to how to kind of cross that pain that brain pain barrier so that um so that you can get beyond where you're currently are because it's written in the mind and here's something i picked up in the airport yes at jfk is the is the national geographic on pain two weeks ago it was a national geographic on um marijuana medicine and i just think awareness of the public the public's um, interest has been peaked. It's not just 
you know, puffing weed anymore. There is the power of plants. There's an acceptance that there is something here which is, which is real and is safe. And for us, um, it's very exciting to be part to partner with different different clinical trials in Israel for autism, um, uh, and just you know, even looking at cerebral palsy and other and other other different novel novel uses for CBD. Um, and I and and as well as looking at the terpenes and the flavonoids, I think there's just a, a very I think 2020 to me like a lot about vision making sure we're clear about what we want to do and carry it out effectively and we can't do everything in one go collaboration i think tom mentioned about the unity unifying capabilities of this plant um not just that it has so many cannabinoids and components is that the people working in this space are going to have to collaborate because it, we cannot do everything it, not everybody can't do everything well <clears throat> and i'm really keen to collaborate on all levels and um collaboration and expansion and growth in a sensible, safe way is what I think Brains is focused on. Amazing, and Tom, you've got clients globally. You've got you've been in this industry, I think, longer than uh, maybe all of our efforts combined, <laughs> um, possibly. What's your expectation for 2020 and the reality uh, for the European market and even the U.S. market? You know, what what is the global cannabis industry and reality in 2020? We would love to have your you know your advice in that regard. So we're getting a lot on the European perspective. I, I think increasingly uh, the, the cannabis world is interconnected, which is wonderful. And we've talked about that. Uh, so let me talk about uh, Europe from the U.S. perspective. I believe that uh, President Trump is going to deschedule cannabis. And uh, the analysis, I think, is, is a, is a two-step analysis. One, uh, I'm Trump. I ask, will I lose a single base voter if I remove cannabis from Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act? Uh, and the answer is absolutely not. And, and in Trump's own words, he could shoot somebody with a gun on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and he wouldn't lose a base voter. And I think that that's right. Uh, and the second step of the analysis, I'm Trump. Uh, will I gain a material number of voters that I wouldn't otherwise have had if I remove cannabis from Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act? And the answer is, of course. So I think uh, based on that two-step analysis, which I'm convinced he's already uh, performed, uh, he's decided to deschedule cannabis before the next election. And I think that his statements uh, yielding to states' rights on the issue uh, is, is essentially uh, telegraphing that to anybody who's thought about it carefully. Um, so whether or not uh, it happens uh, before the election or after the election, I believe it'll happen before the election, uh, when prohibition ends here in the United States, there's going to be a massive influx of capital and the fortune companies that are looking to, uh, uh, to invest and to acquire assets. And that will affect commerce around the globe. It'll be very exciting. There'll be another bubble, um, but there'll be a lot of opportunity as well. So I think it makes sense to plan for that eventuality. So uh, that's my biggest prediction for 2020. Great. You know, like I say, you know, what's your, where, what are the trends for 2020 in reality? And, you know, uh, I know you're ramping up both in the UK and Germany. Um, you know, and especially yeah, I mean, if Trump, and Trump does decriminalize cannabis, what, what does that mean for your businesses in Europe? Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say, actually, I would, I would add to Tom's point that at the moment uh, there is some sort of the scheduling and kind of, you know, maybe federal legalization or at least the Banking Safe Act passing, which I also think will happen in 2020. Um, all the capital will also lead uh, to a massive wave of consolidation among among existing players as well. Um, personally, I mean, my prediction is also um, that uh, more players from other countries than just Australia, Canada, uh, and the Netherlands uh, will able to um, export uh, to Germany. So uh, our chairman is actually Patricia Stoker, the former CEO of uh, Pharmacielo. So uh, again, we have quite a good insight on, on the players in, in Colombia working on very closely and, and being very close to getting a EU GMP license. Uh, you have obviously Jacana and Jamaica working hard. You have the players in Uruguay working hard. So I think 2020 will actually see a lot of new players in, in, the, in the European market in terms of the supply side. And then the medical, I mean, to your point, that will benefit the medical market because you can actually then see probably also slightly price decreases for customers and for patients ultimately um on the wellness side 
again, there are so many CBD brands right now in the market. Again, I think there will be some sort of consolidation. Uh, that consolidation will be driven partly by many brands just shutting down and then kind of, you know, having equity hires uh, out there or also um, just certain players from emerging and, and specializing uh, in, again, as Chana uh, said, in, in, in sport, uh, maybe uh, focused brands in um, beauty focused brands, cosmetics focused brands. I think there will be more specialization in the market, uh, in the wellness market. Um, and maybe also uh, more products coming online, right? So right now, again, in, in, in medical, we only have a handful of different products. In wellness, everybody talks about CBD, but my uh, prediction is that you will have much more CBG, uh, kind of dominant products in the market as well. Uh, you will have probably other cannabinoids uh, being, being kind of, you know, coming to the forefront rather than just, again, CBD and CBG. And you will actually also have way more uh, other nutraceuticals and other kind of health products with CBD or cannabinoids as a, as a combination being marketed as well. I mean, we have some brands like turmeric infused CBD, for example, or you have, um, you know, again, CBD infused drinks, but I think there will be way more uh, product diversity in 2020 as well. I agree with everybody's closing statements. Those were, I, I think that I would make those, those, those assumptions about the 2020 trend myself. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in today's virtual conference on the European market. I want to wish everyone a happy holidays and really um, best of luck in the new year. It's going to be an exciting one, I think, for all of us in the industry. Yeah, thank right. you for all that. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Pleasure speaking with everyone. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.